We're back on a Thursday night. Everybody, Rory Johnston here. Open Line is the program. And Dr. James Hildreth, the president of Meharry Medical College, is with us as we talk about a potential vaccine uh, for coronavirus. And uh, Dr. Hildreth, thank you so much once again for being here. I want to get right to the phones because we have one caller who's been waiting, and that is Dale. Hi, Dale. Welcome. <clears throat> Dale, go ahead. Yeah, hey, how you doing, Rory? And uh, good. Good afternoon to uh, Dr. Hilter as well. Uh, I was just wondering uh, who I should believe as far as um, the CDC or as far as what they say and whether a lot of political things are happening to say one thing versus another one. I remember early on that they said you shouldn't wear a mask. And I remember, I thought I, I, I remember hearing that. And today when I looked at the PBS News Hour, they did have somebody on there that said, the city said you really didn't need a mask, it wouldn't help. But now they're saying, as we know now, everybody should wear a mask. I'm a 45 year old black uh, American, Af African American. I would like to know, I have some friends that are having a barbecue this weekend, with everybody feeling like everything's all well and good. Would you recommend that I go to that barbecue? It's going to be about 20 people there, and I've already thought I don't think it's safe enough. And people are getting mixed messages based on wanting the economy to get stimulated again. And I'd just like to get your opinion on it. And how long do you think realistically that we should be a vaccine uh, coming through? And thank you. Thank you. We'll listen into what Dr. Hilder says. So first, let me just say that the CDC has some extraordinary scientists and public health officials who work there, and they're doing their best to get the, get the facts out to people as best they can. But there's no doubting that there's unfortunately some politics in this. Uh, but what the science says is that it's still necessary for us to take steps to protect ourselves from the virus. The virus isn't going uh, anywhere. It's gonna be with us until one of two things happens, until at least 60% of us have been infected and have some kind of immunity to it, or there's a vaccine that confers that level of immunity. And that's what's referred to as herd immunity, when there's so many people in the population resistant to the virus that it cannot really spread the way it would like to. Uh, my advice to people in terms of large gatherings, because we don't know truly the prevalence of the virus and we don't know truly the the number of people who are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. And we know for sure there are a lot of people out there who are transmitting the virus without knowing it. At today's press conference this morning, I told the story of Albany, Georgia, where two funerals resulted in one of the largest outbreaks in the country, even though it's a town of only 75,000 people. And these individuals obviously did not know they were vectors for the virus, and they unwittingly started this this chain of transmission that resulted right. in, in a high, one of the highest per capita incidents of COVID-19 in, in the state, and I mean, in the, in, the, in the country. So my advice is, if you're gonna to go to a gathering with more than 10 or 20 folks, I would wear gloves, I would make sure I'd practice the social distancing, and if at all possible, I personally am gonna be avoiding those kinds of gatherings, again, because there's a possibility that when there's more than 25 or so people, there's a good chance that someone is gonna be there without knowing they have COVID-19 right. and possibly spread it, spread it to others. And I want so that's I would, a good point, Dr. Hildreth, is the, the so yes. many people are asymptomatic uh, who may feel great and have felt great for months now and are no problem, but they may indeed be positive for coronavirus and they, they felt no need to go get tested. And that is a big concern. Obviously, if you yes. have the symptoms, uh, you know, any kind of symptoms, which we know by now, any kind of fever, uh, respiratory issue uh, is to quarantine yourself and get tested. But others, you know, right. like this, these kind of gatherings that we're seeing, because we are now starting to slowly reopen things. And that is a concern of mine. I keep, I keep masks in my car. Um, and, yeah. you know, here at work, we're very much socially distancing. And for now, I feel fine with just putting a mask on and washing my hands thoroughly after I go into yeah. uh, the, sh the grocery store, right? Right, right, right. And those are, those are the things that are really still very important. And you hit on a great point there. Washing your hands 
is one of the most important things you can do to keep yourself protected. Because truthfully, the, the, the incidents where people get viruses of many kinds by touching contaminated surfaces is one of the biggest challenges we have in public health. So if people got into the habit of washing their hands when going to a store or going to some other venue, because surfaces get contaminated, we touch those surfaces, we can't help but touch our face and we end up inoculating ourselves with the virus. So wearing a face covering and washing hands are just two really important things to do, especially if you're one of the high risk categories, like myself being an older person, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I take extra steps to keep myself protected uh, from the virus and I would urge everybody else to do so. But large gatherings of people who are not mitigating for the virus, it's a very dangerous scenario still. And uh, I think people need to be aware of that. And obviously you understand because you've worked with the city and state leaders, um, this delicate balance, the need to protect the, the public health, but also yes. to to understand that every day everything's shut down, it, it can be devastating economically. So right. we are starting to reopen, but a keen eye, a, a careful eye is being watched on case count uh, and testing, correct, as, as this moves forward? Yes, we want to make sure there was sufficient capacity in, in the hospitals in terms of beds. If there was, if there was a outbreak, we're watching the percent of people who test positive as a ratio of the number of tests done. And for a long time, it was really flat at about 10%, starting to go down, which is a really, really good sign. Uh, so all the benchmarks that we've set, that were set to monitor going forward have been positive. They all are going in the right direction. So we're gonna be vigilant to watch to see what happens. And we have control of this because if people take the steps necessary to keep the virus in check, we can keep moving forward. None of us wants to keep things closed forever. Uh, I, I mentioned on one of the uh, uh, brief things there that I love, again, to be able to take my wife to a movie, uh, but that's not a, that's not a good a scenario right now, having 200 people or more sitting in, in close quarters together. Um, so, but if we just do the things that we need to do, we can keep making forward progress. And I would say to the people in the audience, when you go into a business or uh, uh, into a store, I would actually watch to see whether or not the business has done a good job of protecting their employees and in protecting me as a customer. And if you don't feel comfortable, my suggestion is to not to patronize that business. But I'm really pleased to see that most of the businesses have been very earnest in taking steps to try to protect the people who work there as well as the customers. So I think we can all be encouraged by that as well. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen more plexiglass barriers in my <laughs> life in yes. the last couple of months, but uh, it's there to, It's there for yeah. everyone's safety, just a, an extra level yes. of protection. Exactly. All right, let's go back to the phones, and we've got Dolores now on open line. Hi, Dolores. Hi. What's on your mind? I have uh, three questions. But sure. First, I want to thank Dr. Hildred for being so kind as to explain to us what's going on, how we can protect ourselves, and what to do. My first question deals with um, the, the virus, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I know it targets the lungs, but what does it do in the lungs that is so, uh, what, I guess, detrimental? It causes yeah. like... It can be devastating, sure. Right. I mean, does it cause like the lungs to retain fluid? We drown or... All right. Let's hold on and uh, just listen in for a moment, doctor. Okay. So actually the lung is just part of the problem. Uh, viruses get in our bodies and they are targeted to specific cells because certain cells have receptors that let the virus go into those cells for example hepatitis is caused by a virus that infects the liver and for the most part the liver is all that it targets and so we get hepatitis there are viruses that infect parts of the brain so we get meningitis the point is that the tissue that a virus infects is what is responsible for the kind of symptoms that we see and as it turns out the COVID-19 receptor, which is a protein called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, is found throughout our bodies. It's in the lungs, it's in our GI tract, the gut, it's in the kidneys, it's in the testes, it's in parts of the brain. And that is why you're seeing such a broad spectrum of, dis of diseases and symptoms. Blood clots is a new thing that we're seeing because the small blood vessels 
uh, they're not functioning properly because of the virus, so the blood stands and clots. Uh, people are losing their sense of smell and taste. There are GI abnormalities. There are people who come in with confusion from neurological symptoms. So this is all because the virus is impacting not just the lungs, which we know about, but it's impacting other things. But in the lungs, there are these thin membranes called alveoli, where oxygen is taken up from the air into the, pro the protein hemoglobin in red blood cells. And it's a single layer of cells that separate the air from, from the blood. And when the virus infects our lungs, it causes inflammation. So there's an accumulation of fluid and lots and lots of cells that impair the function of breathing because the air exchange cannot happen. And the other thing that happens is the immune system can be so exuberant that not only does it attack the virus, it starts to attack our own tissues. And that can be uh, very deadly. And a lot of people who are dying from this is not because necessarily the virus is destroying tissue, but the immune response wow. is so big that that's part of what causes people to die. Interesting. All right. Well, Dolores, what was your second question? Can I have a, a, another question? Is, yeah. With all that's going on and the medicines that we're using, we've seen in recent years, uh, what I guess, safe medicines becoming mm -hmm. toxic to us. I can remember the thalidomide pro you know, problem, and right. then we have like talc. And we have the, uh, what is it, next, whatever that is, causing different kind of cancers. Mm -hmm. The long-term consequences of the drugs that they're using now, the, the new drugs that they're using now to treat COVID, is there any indication that we might have to deal with that later in life? Uh, for the time being, there's no indication that there are gonna be long-term consequences. First of all, we don't really have a drug that's been proven to be effective against COVID-19. The one drug you heard about is remdesivir. It was actually developed to treat Ebola. And again, viruses have similarities in the proteins they use, the mechanisms. So it was observed that the mechanism between Ebola and... Anyway, there was a basis to believe that remdesivir might have utility against COVID-19, so they're trying it. Uh, sure. And so far, it's only a limited amount of data, but it looks promising. But we don't have enough evidence to say whether or not they're going to be long-term consequences and keep in mind that using drugs for COVID-19 is probably going to be a short-term thing not like HIV people who have HIV have been taking drugs for years and years and years right so the long-term toxicity is a big challenge there but in the case of COVID-19 the treatment is probably going to be a shorter term and it's not likely but isn't it you can't say it's impossible that you would see those long-term consequences like you might see with drugs that have to be taken for a long, long periods of time. Okay, if that makes Dolores. Sense. Okay, can I ask one more? Yeah, go ahead. Fire away, okay. real quick. Okay, the um, problem of reinfection, you know, if you get COVID, COVID and you recover, yeah. there's no long-term uh, verification that you can or cannot get it again. And if you do get it again, would it be as severe? Okay. So... I, there are two things here. One is uh, there were just two papers published in one of the top medical journals where they did an experiment in monkeys. They think monkeys and humans have, are genetically similar enough that the COVID-19 virus infects monkeys just like it does infect humans. So they infected the monkeys with COVID-19. The monkeys' immune responses did their job. They cleared the virus. They waited a period of time and they asked whether or not the monkeys could be reinfected, and the answer was no. They were able to demonstrate that the immune response to the virus during the infection was sufficient to give the monkeys immunity to right. it. So, so based on those studies, we now have the promise that infection with COVID-19 leads to immunity. And unfortunately, the data in humans is not quite as clear yet, but we do know that when people get infected by COVID-19, they make an antibody response. And we do see a limited amount of neutralizing activity in those convalescent serum from, the, from, from humans. But the, the data is still out as to whether or not the level of immunity is enough to, re, to prevent reinfections. Mm -hmm. And some of you may have heard the stories about people getting reinfected, including some sailors. Well, it turns out that they did not get reinfected. The, the test that was taken subsequently was a false positive. Right. And here's why I was positive that the test we use to detect 
COVID-19 is so sensitive that they actually detected trace amounts of genetic material from the virus. And that's how sensitive sure. it is. So it wasn't that they were detecting the virus, mm -hmm. they were detecting a small amount of residual genetic material from the infection. And that's what appeared to be a reinfection, but it really wasn't. Right. It was a false positive test from the nucleic acid. Good to know. Yes. All right. Great questions. We've got a number of callers now lined up. We're going to take another quick break and we'll be back more with your questions and Dr. James Hildreth right after this.